Hi, my name is Glenn. I uh, or Glenn Renfro. I work for Pivotal. Uh, we are also hiring. <laughs> I just had to throw that in there. Um, I've been with Pivotal about three years. I actually was uh, one of the, I would say not the first, but one of the first group of people that they hired. I work with a Spring group. I am a contributor and committer to Spring Cloud uh, Dataflow, Spring Cloud um, Task. I will be contributing more to Spring Batch because we're going to be refreshing Spring Batch coming in the next year. So uh, that will be something that we will be, um, hope that you'll be seeing some announcements on that as time goes on. Um, I will be speaking at Spring One on one of the subcomponents that we're going to be talking about of Spring Cloud Dataflow, which is called Spring Cloud Task. Um, so uh, lots going on at Spring. To the question of web or uh, you know, of uh, you know, uh, at microservices, um, take a look at Spring Cloud Offering. Um, that, is a, uh, that will help you simplify your microservice application. Um, we also have Spring Net, uh, Cloud Netflix. Take a particular look at that. There's a lot of features in that that simplify that. Um, there's a lot of articles on it, discussions. Um, I'm going to talk, a, you know, in this talk today, um, we will discuss very briefly microservices. And I will not be bashing monoliths, okay? I want people to know I, that's not what this is about. When we talk about microservices, microservices are yet another architecture that you could take advantage of when you're making your decision as a senior developer or an architect um, as to you get a new application or you're having to refresh an application. What's the best way to handle it, right? Sometimes a monolith is just fine, but sometimes you need to say, hey, this is a perfect app for microservices. Um, so what we're going to be talking about is three major components. One is the overall uh, uh, view, is, which is Spring Cloud Dataflow. And we're going to save that to the end. That's the good stuff. That's the fun stuff. The other two are good, but what, uh, what they do is uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow is built on streams and tasks. Okay, And we'll talk a little bit of what I mean more uh, by that and how Dataflow simplifies that. Uh, we're going to go through a lot of buzzwords. So like Chris brought up, Kafka. If you, I mean, how many of you know what Kafka is? Raise your hand. See? Now that means I just have to take that one off the buzzword list. <laughs> OK, done. Um, but with as anything, if there's a question you have on something I said or something you don't know, ask me. OK? And as um, we go through the presentation, ask. It helps me drive the presentation, make it more key to you. But also, um, you know, it makes me know that I'm clearly communicating. If we start running on time, I might say, let's parking lot that. If I don't know the answer, you'll automatically hear me say, let's go parking lot that. Uh, so um, oops, knock that around there. So let's talk briefly about microservices. So I, you know, you, it, 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 there's so many ways you can define it. But I thought Martin Fowler did it best when he said it's basically an architectural style where your application is built on small services, each running in their own process and communicating with each other over a lightweight framework. Okay, um, there are several advantages to doing that. Um, me and Burke actually had a discussion beforehand that there are some disadvantages to also doing microservices. So um, I do not have a personal recommend. Yeah. Uh, well, some people would say that would be maybe something as easy as HTTP. In today's discussion, we're going to be talking something a little bit more sturdy, like a Rabbit um, or a Kafka as your uh, lightweight framework. Um, this also, you can use uh, Geo um, or Geode slash uh, Gemfire. You can use that. Uh, Redis is another that you can do as a way of means of communication between your apps. That's a little bit more durable and persistent. Um, and one of the things that you're going to see, one of the future slides is as we talk about these microservices and the connectivity, is the decision that you need to make of what that framework is. What are the criteria for that? OK. Did that answer your question? OK. <laughs> All right. Um, so the one thing that I want to, you know, I mentioned briefly about microservices is that it has a lot of advantages. I, I try to say, was there a book I would recommend? And I've actually looked up about three. Uh, I've read two of the three. 
Um, I wish I had written them down. I didn't. Shame on me. And I'm horrible with titles if I don't have them in my notes. But there are several good books out there. I highly recommend that if you're a senior developer, want to be an architect, or you're an architect, or even if you're a junior developer working your way to senior, pick up one of these books. Look on Amazon, get a good rec recommendation, and review it. Add, and then it's not the end-all, be-all solution, but it's something that you can say, hey, when we're building the app, this is something we may want to consider. So what is a stream? Um, as a fisherman, I would say it is a place where I go fishing, where fish exist. Uh, but my boss begs to differ. He says it's a way in which we can ingest or process data as it's received. Okay? A way to think about that as well is that um, when you have data, you can, data can pushed to you, right? You can be getting data from an HTTP. You can get it from Stomp. You can be uh, uh, getting or seeing data just straight through TCP. I could also be pulling data. I mean, everything from doing a directory monitor, looking and pulling data files from in FTP, kind of old school, but still around big time, right? Um, it could be anything where your inception point of data going into your stream is Kafka. It could be Rabbit, not used as a transport, or I should say the, uh, the, that lightweight messaging service, but as something which you're going to be pulling data from. So when we look at a stream, there's about uh, ignore the little car for right now, I'll talk about that, um, is it's comprised of three major components. Okay? The first component is the source. This is the guy uh, that receives the data. His job is just to be available to either pull the data, receive the data, or maybe if it's like a timer, it generates the data and kicks off the stream. Okay? Every stream has exactly one source. Okay? The next is the processor. Every stream may not have one. Every stream, a stream can have zero or more um, uh, processors. A processor can do one of, the one of the following. It can transform data. It can filter data. It can enrich your data. Um, sometimes it can kick off and do uh, some analysis on your data. It's kind of whatever you need it to be. And you can have as many processes in your stream as necessary. Okay, so we have one source, zero more sinks, or sorry, sinks, processors, and then finally we have a sink. Every stream has exactly one sink. Okay, this is where all the data goes, and it's either A, persisted somewhere to a file system, HDFS, uh, database, or maybe it sends out an email, a text, um, maybe sends it some, another message out TCP. Effectively, it's the end of your stream. So, okay, I got an idea of a stream. What's a real world case? So, uh, since this has been recorded and my boss will be watching the recording, I will say that Michael Manella um, actually did what was called a connected car. Okay? And this connected car demo has kicked off so many sales at Pivotal, it's unreal. If you uh, even look at our investor statement, you'll see that we have a big car manufacturer somewhere around us. And I think that was, this is one of the impetuses for it. So here's a, demo, a sample. I've got a car, and every so often, it will emit events to a service. It could be engine temperature, statistics on the engine, your location. Big Brother is watching. Um, and in turn, they can take this data, transform it into something they need, and store it off. Yay. So now we've got created what? Black data. OK, we've got data out there, you know, or dark data. So it's dark data. And so, OK, we're storing all this data. And that they can go back in and run batch jobs or whatever and get the, and glean information out of it. Or they can be more tactical. They can be able to maybe take and tap off of this guy as this data is coming in, maybe tap right after the transform, and then look at maybe hey, this person's uh, car just notified him that he needs to do an oil, or she needs to do an oil change. We need to tell this guy that, hey, you've got to uh, check engine light, you need, and they get a text saying, hey, oh, oh my, check engine light's on. Oh, I need to change my oil. Oh, if I press this button and go to this link over here, I can you know, go ahead and schedule a time to go to my dealer to have my car serviced. 
Um, this is not something that's strictly for vehicles. It's happening for almost all equipment. Okay? People are looking at how to directly integrate what you have in a, uh, uh, as a console or whatever and be able to take that data and act on it immediately. Okay? So this is not an uncommon case. <clears throat> So streams allow us to be able to act on data as it's coming in. But here's our, uh, our fun part. Somebody's got to write the code, right? And you know, how can we simplify that? So uh, uh, Mark, pa uh, Mark Fisher and Pollock and a guy named uh, Marius got together and they created what's called Spring Cloud Streams. It is a way in which we can, I think it puts it best, I'm going to go to the second line, says uh, is a framework for building message-driven microservices. And basically, what you're going to see when I take, and I'm going to create just a very baseline spring integration app, I'm going to add one annotation to it, and then that automatically makes it into a, uh, a given service or an app, or, or I should say a service in a uh, microservice stream. So if you think about it, we're saying a stream could be a microservice because we're going to be creating it um, from a series of apps. And so what do I mean by that? Going back to this image, each of these components that we're looking at are services in my, what we're going to call my, app, my stream application or my stream microservice application. Each of these are boot apps, or Spring Boot. How many of you had a chance to actually work, or let's say, who knows what Spring Boot is? Finally. <laughs> Over 70%, yes. So in this case, each of these are Spring Boot apps. So what we're saying is, if you go back to original definition, each of these are small, uh, are, are services running in their own process that comprise an application, OK? And Spring Cloud Stream allows us to be able to create each of those services simply. And we're going to actually uh, do a little coding and take a look at that. So one of the common questions is, is, yeah, OK, cool. I can write, write my own. But do you have anything that we can not have to worry about all the boilerplate stuff? Like you talked about doing a directory monitor, you know, going in, looking to see if there's a file there. Because this has already been done by, what, Spring Integration. How many of you have actually worked with Spring Integration or know what it is? Oh, OK, all right, that's good, good. All right, it's 40%. How many of you have worked with Spring Batch? Jeez, i got to tell Michael. He'll be so happy. But nonetheless, we have a series of, of stock, uh, uh, what we're going to call stream apps, that are available to you. Now, ignore that I have Twitter stream written twice, and I can't spell uh, throughput down there. It's more throughput. And the worst part is, I wrote throughput. Um, in short, we have available sources that you could take advantage of, a file, FTP, JMS, load generator, TCP, trigger, uh, Twitter stream, Twitter search. Uh, those last two are more for you know demo purposes, but they're actually live. They work. Um, you can uh, they hook into Garden Hose, and you can actually actually had one company when I did a training uh, not too long back, and uh, they they while I was talking about it, they went in, downloaded Spring Cloud Dataflow, <laughs> implemented this, and uh, they did the and they actually showed the demo that I was giving them. They said we can use this tomorrow. And I'm not, that's not a ploy. And by the way, everything you see up here, it's all open source. There's no upsell. It's all there available. You can look at the source code. Um, if you see my name on there, you'll know he actually committed to it. Yay. Um, but you have all these sources. You have these processors. It's just a base set of processors. You have a filter. You have a groovy uh, filter and transforms. You've got PMML if you're doing predictive stuff. Um, split or transform. You have all these syncs that are available to you. And we'll talk about tasks in a little bit. Okay, these are all available to you. We'll show you how to uh, how you can take advantage of those. So I think it's time for demo. So what we're going to do in our little demo is I'm just going to have a polar. It's just what we're going to call this one TikTok, or in this case I think I called it Test Talk. And what we're going to do is it's going to generate a message once a second. Well, maybe once every five seconds, and it's just going to write that out to a console. Okay. And we're going to have it where the messaging, what we're going to call our binder between the two, is going to be rabbit. OK? So I've got to sit down for this because it's so awesome, I can't stand.
<laughs> yeah, Glenn. Relax, Glenn. All right, so I'm going to go and create new project. And let's see. There we go. And I'm going to use, if, if you have, also, if you've ever had a chance to play with Spring Boot, do so. If you're already playing with Spring Boot, you probably know about this, but you can go to Spring Initializer. Ah, oh, crud. Now, there's only one thing about Spring Initializer that you need to have. A network. Didn't think about that, did I? Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Talks among yourselves. There we go. We'll wait. Hey, look. There's Lynn's iPhone. Amazing. Hack at it at your own risk. Okay, here we go. Let's go to previous. Go to next. Oh my gosh, there it is. Ladies and gentlemen. All right. So what we're going to do is we're going to create our source. Remember we said before, a, a stream can be any, any, has to be one source, one sync, zero more processors. I'm being lazy. No processors this time. So we're going to call it a jug, and we will name it source. Okay. We're going to click next. And so I need to be able to uh, go in, and I want to use Rabbit as my binder. Like, well, how am I going to connect these things together? So i got to go down to cloud messaging, and I can choose Kafka or Rabbit. We're going to use Rabbit. Uh, my project name is Ajug Source. That's fine by me. And we go in, and we see. Oh, by the way, can y'all see that? Or is it any bigger? Is it good? OK. Nods ahead in the back means it's good. Very good. I'm happy now. I can go home. All right. There we go. So what we're going to do is this is a regular boot app. Nothing special about it. So what we're going to do is we're going to make this into, I don't know, a service in our web, for our web app. Or our web app. I'm old. For This is going to be a service in our uh, microservice app. So we're going to say at enable, binding. OK, remember, we're binding these to something. And we'll say source dot class, because again, it can be a source, it's a processor, or sync. We're going to let it do its magic and in update our, op, our uh, imports. Now, we're going to do something a little fun. We're going to create a bean. And by the way, uh, this entire presentation is on my GitHub account. And at the last slide, you'll actually have a link to where it's at. So, you know, if you, if you, you know, I highly recommend using Initializer, but you can just pull it off my GitHub site and use it. Because also, if I fudge finger something, um, I go there and copy and paste. So we're going to make an inbound channel adapter. And we're going to make sure that, let's see, that the value here meaning we got to be receiving uh, or sending data out somehow, is going to be sync dot, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. Dang, I'm ahead of myself. I want to get over this over with. I wanted to do that. Source dot output, okay. And then I want to create a polar. And we're going to say equals at polar. And then from here, we're going to go ahead and say our fixed, uh, oh, sorry. I forgot to, sorry. Fit, okay. And there we go. Come on, help me out. Help me, Obi-Wan. There we go. Hey! There we go. And we're going to say our fixed delay. Let me scroll this over is equal to 5,000 millis. So it's going to poll once every five seconds. We're going to send exactly one message per poll. right? And then we're going to have a public. And we're going to have a message source. OK. That's going to return a string. It's going to be Hello World if you haven't figured that out yet. Oh, no. <laughs> he is so original. And we'll call it my message source. Okay, and if my jokes get old, you can say, stop it. And in this case, we're going to have a little lambda here. 
Boy, I'm starting to sound like an art guy there. A little lambda here. New generic message. And we'll say, hello world. OK. Now I have just created my source. I'm done. OK. Now, what I can do is I can say, all right, well, Glenn, that's great. How do you know what you're going to connect to? So this is when we engage our properties. We need to tell it, OK, I want to give my source, I want to output it to a, a given, I want to put all the data it's outputting to a given destination, right? So something can pick it up and not just magically know how. So here's my first cut and paste because I tried to type this from memory and I always fudge fingered it, so this is where Glenn cheats. So what we're going to do is I'm going to rename this as a YAML because you, in Spring Boot you can set your properties via properties file or YAML. Okay. And then we're going to go to demo2. And we're going to explain what, you're, what I'm adding here. Okay. What did I add there? So as, we, as with any boot application, you, you have the ability to have endpoints available so that you can go in and view the state of your app, the condition of your app, and that's available out of the box, free of charge, um, via uh, just hitting off a web port. So that's what that first port is. So I'm setting it default to 8080. Um, I fixed, I could have put the variable in there, but I just went ahead and yeah, put the fixed, but I could have used just put fixed delay in there to, for that polar to say once every five seconds, so I can actually cut this out, don't need it. But here's what I wanted to talk about just really quickly. Spring Cloud Stream Bindings Output.Destination, what does that mean? In short, what that does is that says, okay, everything I'm writing out, I want to write it out to test talk as a destination. And for if it's you're using Kafka, it's going to write it out to the test talk topic. If you're writing it to uh, Rabbit, that's going to be a test talk queue. Okay, that's so just letting you know. I'm setting the uh, content type to text plain because I want us to be able to read it. So basically, that's it. So it's the thing I messed up something. What did I mess up? Oh, quote. There we go. Everything's green, and we launch. Okay. We lose a little bit more space there. Yeah, no. You're like, dang, dude. Now you're making all my mail. It's awful. All right, here we go. Let's zoom in on this a little bit. What did Glenn do? So notice that um, I created what's called test talk, right? And it created an exchange since I chose Rabbit. I could have chose Kafka. I chose Rabbit because for now, Rabbit has a, a well, not anymore. Kafka has actually got a pretty good uh, a monitoring tool now that you can use. Uh, but at the time I wrote this, I went, okay, I'll use Rabbit because it's already installed. Um, so once every uh, five seconds, it emits a message. Um, in this case, by default, the way we have it configured, that so long as if there's not a consumer, it just tosses the message. Okay, you can configure it through settings to say, if the producer's producing something, please store it. In this case, we just by default saying if there's no consumers, toss the message. So that's the reason why the queue is not growing. Okay, so let's go back and let's add our sync. So now we have a source, it's up and running, we're all happy, right? And if you have any questions, ask. Okay, cool. And now I'm a little nervous now, Vincent. And he's not even paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. We'll do AJUG and we're gonna call this sync. Okay? So now we're gonna create the second part, but like we did before, we want to go to cloud messaging. We're gonna choose select Dream Rabbit. Okay, new window. We go here, and we're going to have a service activator do some work for us. Again, we're going to do enable binding. We want to change this to the last service in our uh, 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 microservice application. And then we're going to make that a sync.class. Okay. Again, we need to update our import. And let me give us a little bit more room here. Sorry about all this good stuff. All right, and what we're going to do now is, oh, let's do that, hold on, there we go. We'll create a service activator. In this case, we're going to do at um, service activator, 
And it has to take an input channel, right? So we're going to say sync dot input. Okay, public void, and then we're going to say my you know, service activator. And then we're going to have it accept a message. And we can have it as an object. I'll make that object, make it generic. What the heck? Okay, that's not a piglin. There we go. And we're going to do a system dot out system public metrics. That's cool. And we're going to say message received. And then we're going to go ahead and say message. Again, coding's done. Let's set up our properties, right? I need to say, hey, I want to hook into that test talk queue that the uh, source is writing to. Okay, so once again, I'm going to go to my cheat sheet again. Here we go. And it's just a little different, but not by much. And it will look something like this. Again, let's do a rename that. Okay. There we go. Okay. And notice that I chose a different port. Why? Because now that I have two boot apps are running, they both can be monitored. We don't want to have a port collision, so it's 8081 instead of 8080. But the only difference that you see here beside that 8081 is this. Notice instead of bindings out output, which was sent out by the source, this is the input being received by my sync, and the destination is tech talk. So I just allow these guys to connect. And we'll fire that guy up. Boop, boop, boop. There we go. And you can't see that, can you? All right. Um, well, I'm going to cheat just a little bit then. I know that's not cheating. That's even worse. Okay. Well, it'll eventually, well, let's do it this way. Here we go. Whoop. There we go. Well, that didn't help worth a darn. Hold on. There we go. All right. We can see that Hello World is being emitted. Okay. And it's still emitting. Okay. So what did we do? So let's take a look back at the rabbit real quick. And I swear we'll move on. I know I'm. And so if we look at the queues, we can actually see where it created an anonymous queue. And it, so now my data is being transferred from my source to my sync. And what did we write? We added an enable binding to a small boot application. We added two, really effectively, just two properties. One just setting the, um, you know, the uh, uh, endpoints for our boot app so that you can be monitored and they wouldn't collide. And I just told them how to connect to each other by just saying, you know, input, uh, binding input and binding output. That's it. And now we have our first stream uh, microservice built app. Okay. Questions on that? Sir. So, uh, your Rabbit, if you want to do like a topic or uh, file over both things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You can, there's a configurations that you can take advantage of that we're not showing, but you can go hit our documentation and uh, hit the Spring Cloud stream documentation, not data flow, but Spring Cloud stream documentation, and it discusses the configurations that you want to do. I mean, um, can I cheat and, and answer your question in a just a little bit different way? I think it's still going to be good. Um, let's go back to the presentation here. There we go. Is that you can choose any of these binders right now. I mean, again, these are how we bind these together. This is a lightweight messaging framework. You can use Rabbit, Gemfire, Kafka. We have a group working on the JMS as well. Um, it's, it was not a priority for us at, out the gate, but Kafka was just for the sheer popularity and what people are using it with it. Everything from you know just you know making their world all uh, Kappa, um, but with, with each of these, there's configurations that you can take advantage of to uh, how you want to handle your topics. 
for example, how do you want to configure topic and how you want to, or how you want to configure your queues, topics, and uh, Rabbit. And also, one of the things I also will recommend um, is also allows you to tune them. Okay. Um, I'm going to go back a little bit in time. Last year, I did a presentation for Spring One, and there's a Spring, and you can look up uh, an article that or a blog I wrote. It's called Spring XD. I say I wrote it was me and uh, Mark Pollock um, wrote, and it's um, Spring XD performance tuning. Don't worry about the XD side. Worry about how I say you test your infrastructure to make sure your infrastructure can do what you need it to do. For example, with uh, Kafka. Kafka is incredibly fast, but only if you have incredibly fast or good uh, write speeds on your, uh, on your disk, right? Since it's that logging uh, paradigm. While uh, Rabbit, um, is, you can treat it as in memory or you can uh, persist a disk, but they're both constrained by that. You have to check your network. You also, for example, with uh, Rabbit, you know, out of the box, most people say, okay, what's your prefetch size? And it's usually, what, one? That's great if you've got a low volume, but if you want to do 25,000 events a second, you need to have a prefetch higher, 5, 10, 50, right? So those configurations are available to you. Um, the decision of what you, which one of these you want is based on your experience with each of the products. It's also based on how much throughput you need, where with Kafka, you know, we can show where you can do a million events a second, literally, okay? Um, with Rabbit, it's not that high, but Rabbit is incredibly rich in the interfaces that it offers. What do you need? And what's your experience level? Do you feel more comfortable with? Um, or your company, right? So before I go on, I'm going to be switch switching topics. So we, remember, there was three parts. Spring Cloud Stream, we we're going to talk about Spring Cloud Task, and then we'll get to data flow. So we're still on the components that build up data flow. Okay, any questions? Yes, ma'am. Do you think the signers also work well with bi-temporal data? Like what? The message is the message in that sense. Meaning, what to think about it is that the data that's going between the two um, is not the, 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 the binder doesn't really care. It just says that somebody received the message. I'm going to make sure I take that message, whatever it is, whether it's a POJO whether it's a text message, whether it's JSON, whatever, or binary data, I'm just going to pass that data along. It's kind of agnostic to that. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, sir. I'll get you. How does it deal with concurrency in the sinks? You talk about Kafka. If I bring up 10 of those mm -hmm. receivers, does it now use the same queue? Oh, yeah. In that case, same topic. And yes, you, you can do the partitioning that's available from Kafka, you can partition out and you can actually set up multiple. Um, so one of the th other things you get through uh, the concept of um, microservice, but we, and we also offer part of that, is okay, all right, I'm, I'm writing stuff out to Kafka, but maybe I'm constrained. I'm not writing as fast as Kafka can handle. I should be able to increase the number of my sinks, right? And then by, if I increase that number of sinks, I want it to um, be able to write to each of those sinks in a specific fashion, right? And you can set that up, and you can also do what we have, what's called partitioning logic, that you can select, and you can modify how, you're, how it handles that. You can also do it on the inbound. So uh, I'm listening on Rabbit, and I've got 30 possible. Yes, yes, you can do that. You can basically... Um, I know I don't mean to give people headaches here, but any of these components, and this is a classic case where I might have an HTTP server that's just blazingly fast and it's okay. I might have a file that's blazingly fast and it's okay to write stuff out, but maybe my transform is incredibly slow. I can bump up that number dynamically. One of the things that we're going to talk about in a couple of minutes, I'm being very generic right now, is you should be able to deploy these to not only your local infrastructure, but you should be able to deploy these out to Cloud Foundry, right? Mesos, Yarn, um, and Kubernetes. And Spring Cloud Dataflow does that for you. You don't have to worry about those in details. So that I can take this stream, each of these three services that comprise it, use Spring Cloud Dataflow and push them out to Cloud Foundry 
and tell it, I want to have, you know, out of the box, I want to have one, three, one. And then once they're out there, let's say Christmas time rolls around and we need to bump it up, I can go to my Cloud Foundry um, UI and then say, I need to bump that up to six, 12, six. And do that dynamically. That's one of the other advantages is that we talked about, uh, me and Perk talked about, um, is that I can dynamically increase a given service within my stream at any time. I can set defaults, but I can also adjust it as necessary. Yes, sir. I got to get to you first. You ask, and I'll get to you. Okay. All, all of them, and and I don't mean that loosely. Um, we've. You can like again. It's Mesa. We support Mesos, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry. Who pays my salary? <laughs> and uh, yarn. Yes, sir. I am sorry. I put. Uh, yeah. If my app has a requirement that I cannot do the message and it has to be sequenced, the sequencing is very important. Yeah, and that's going to be that's going to be in the configuration. Of, of your rabbit. And if there is any exception generated in the processor of saying put a message it goes back in the queue. Again, that's going to be the configuration. And the other thing to keep in mind is that, um, you know, we have the stock uh, um, uh, uh, components that we gave you, uh, or st stock apps. You can take any of those apps and you can go to Spring Cloud Stream App Starters, pull that down, and modify it to what you need it to be. And then you can create that like, logic that says, okay, I just received this message, you know, I'm gonna fail it, okay? How, what do you mean by fail it? Do you mean to re enqueue it? Do you mean to put it on a DLQ? What do you need it to do? Well, that's a good question. Um, yes, sir? What are the deliveries to manage it? Guaranteed at least once? Or you can figure that. that. Yeah, that's configuration. I hate saying that. I know. It's like, but yeah, I mean, I'll put it to you this way. When this Spring Cloud Dataflow was built on Spring XD, and XD had about a two-year run. And what happened was is that we had a chance to deploy it to the real world. We had a chance to exercise these semantics with it. But what we found is, is that if, and I'm not going to go too far down this path, is that with XD we had these big containers that we were managing. And then we realized very quickly that, you know, what we're actually working and building is microservices. And why are we building these containers when we have platforms like, you know, Cloud Foundry, um, Kubernetes, Mesos, and Yarn that already do this stuff for us? Why are we building this? And that's when about a year ago we said, okay, a little over a year ago, let's drop the containers and just push it directly to these platforms. And so that's what, and so my point is, is that we, the configurations that we built in are actually don't come directly from us per se. They were built from experience, well, let's put it this way. First off, they come from Spring Integration, which already supports that. And also Spring and AMQP, if you're using AMQP, um, this also comes from the Spring Kafka project. So these guys have the experience and have all these configurations built in already. And then we just built on top of that. And then we used our experience with XD and, and customers along with customer feedback from the rest of the world and tw tweaked and added the new configurations to allow that to happen. So I, I hate saying configuration, configuration, but in some cases it is. But that's a good question, though. Okay. Now going ready for tasks, the thing I work on a lot. Oh, yeah. Come on. Let's see. It's 8 o'clock. Will he shut up by 9? Will he shut up by 9? Okay, um, I went to streams. Look at there. No, let's go back down a little further. Boom, boom. All right, tasks. So, um, what's the thing about uh, a spring about a, a, a service that comprises of microservices? Typically, when that microservice goes down, or the, sorry, that service within the microservice goes down, we want our platform to what? Bring it back up, right? So, if I have three syncs that are like we talked about, Kafka syncs that may be writing out to Kafka or maybe writing out to HDFS, one of them goes down. For whatever reason, we want that platform to bring it back up because it's a part of a stream. Tasks are a little different. What happens if I want to have a bill run? Okay. Or I want to migrate data from this one spot to another spot based on a series of events. We want it to start, do some work, and then terminate. And 
not be resident. We don't want it just sitting there waiting to get a message to do this work and to stay in, in you know, in take up uh, process space on our, um, in our cloud. We want it to do its job and leave, okay? Typical scenarios are spring batch or any kind of batch app, right, that does some kind of work, does the work, and is over. This is critical because we, if you have a bunch of microservices that have these services within them that do nothing but take up space on something they may do once a day, once a week, that's costing you money. And we've heard this over and over and over again. So we created a concept called task. And a task is a short-lived microservice that performs a function and ends. That way it frees up the space, frees up memory, so other things can take and use it as necessary. But in order to do that, there are some things that a, what a task must be able to do. For example, it must be able to record its state when it started and when it completed. And it has to write that somewhere. Many of these platforms already support that, but they do it in different ways. Um, as of uh, one, the next release or the next release after that, Cloud Foundry will be supporting tasks, where traditionally it, it only supported services, and if the service, again, was up and running, if it failed, or ended normally, it would restart it, okay? And now they're offering the concept of task as well. So what we wanted to be able to do is, um, but it, each of these platforms have different rules. You can configure them to some degree, um, but basically they will eventually eject or remove that information. And what if you want to persist that data of when that app started and stopped for a period of time? Okay, Cloud Foundry is extremely tight because what Cloud Foundry does is after two minutes or after two attempts of trying to call your callback method, it will just eject the fact that it ever ran the task. Okay, so this was very critical. Um, notifies apps of its status. So what if we wanted the ability to have a stream be kicked off after a task finishes? We should be able to do that and notify other apps that we're doing something. We should be able to do remote partitioning. Now, this is a little different than what we talked about before, like what Chris brought up. This is where it's more of a kind of a batch partition where I may receive a job, and I want to be able to break that job up into 10 even segments so that these can be run in parallel. And then when they complete, we aggregate the result. And that way, I can take advantage of that. Should be able to support that. Lastly, it need to do cleanup, and this is before or after processing. It need to be able to do some setup and cleanup when we're done. And you're like, man, that's a lot of code to write just for a task. But luckily, voila, we have it. Spring Cloud Task does that for you. And it's uh, basically a framework for building uh, uh, the infrastructure you need to be able to support a short-lived uh, microservice or ephemeral microservice. Um, tasks are boot apps like what we saw before, but they have a, start, a, a specified start and end. A uh, task is not always a batch job. It is just a boot app. That was one of the things that we got over and over again. We, like, we had people say, love batch, but there's so much logging and so many things that it does that we just don't need. We just want to run this one little tiny Java app, let it do its work and terminate. But we want to know that it stopped and started. We want to do some setup and some tear down after. And we went, well, we can do that, among other things. So um, but like we had with Spring Cloud Stream, which had some uh, uh, basic uh, uh, apps that were out of the box. We also have some tasks. We're going to be adding more to these. Um, and that is we have the Spark Client, Spark Cluster, Spark Yarn, some scoop stuff. And you see the JDBC HDFS, which is a migration, moves data from a JDBC store to an HDFS, and then vice versa. You see there's two asterisks by that. The asterisk for JDBC to HDFS will be removed this week. I submitted a PR on that, and they're reviewing it right now, and I've already told me that I need to update my versions, which made me cry. Um, so, but the HDFS JDBC will be soon after. So what do we mean by task? Let's go ahead and have, have some fun. All right. So first things first, let's go back to our IntelliJ, and let's go real quick. Sorry about that. Go back to our sync, and we see it's still running, producing Hello Worlds. OK, we can now tell it to stop producing Hello Worlds. It's, you've done your job. You can, you can take a nap. All right, there we go. So in this case, 
we'll go back to our initializer. We're actually not going to be doing too much with it right now, but we will nonetheless still click next. And let me just do this. Boop, there we go. And we'll call this a jug task. Click next. And at this point, a, uh, tasks do not have a, uh, they do have it, but it's more for the Spark and the Scoop uh, examples. We don't have anything for just a default task like we had for stream, which makes me cry again. But that will be coming soon as well. So we'll just skip past that, and then we will, uh, oh crap, I just forgot to remove it. Hold on. Goodbye. There we go. Yes, I practiced before I came in. And we'll go here. So what do we see here? We see a jug application, nothing major there. Um, not much to show. We we're going to go in our properties, and I'm just going to add a little bit of logging here. And I'm going to change it for org.springframework.cloud. Hold on. Build dot. Okay. Well, blah. Okay. It's going to be stubborn tonight. I'm trying to think. Oh, I know why. All right. Yes, Lynn, wake up. He forgot a step in his. So one of the things we had before is that we had the initializer would actually add our dependencies for us. We didn't have to worry about that. In this, we have to add our dependency directly. So let's cheat a little bit and start here. You can end for that, I don't care. Is, remember how we had enable binding before? Well, let's just have enable, what, task. And it says, I don't know what that is. Let's add a maven dependency. Add, import those changes, and there we go. Okay, so now we've just made this a task. Let's make this a little bit more real. Let's actually do something what we're working on. So we're going to create an at bean, and this is going to be a public command line runner. It's not going to take anything. It's going to turn a new. What? Command line runner. Oops. My command line runner. And there we go. There we go. And we're going to have it do just a system.out.println. And it's just going to do a hello world task. Nothing major. Okay. And then we're going to go to our application properties. And now we can actually finish this out and say dot org dot spring framework dot cloud dot task dot debug or equals debug. Now, before I go that far, I'm just going to disable this and we're just going to run a quick run of it. Just see what a normal boot app would look like. It runs. And we see nothing but our normal annotation in being hello world task, and then a jug task application says, okay, I'm done. Now when I do an enable task, enable that, it changes slightly. Same run, but, let's see here. We, I apologize. We see where we're actually doing creating a task execution, uh, and we can see that it gave it an execution ID, and notice that the first one says the exit code null, but when it finished, it gave an exit code of zero and gives you the start time and end time of that app. Okay? But we haven't really done anything yet. We just logged it, right? Well, let's make it a little bit more real without adding any more code. How can we do that? So let's make it a little bit more real. Let's go to our palm. And let's add just a couple more things. And this is just boot magic, by the way. First thing we're going to do is we're going to add a dependency. And we're going to add a Maria 
uh, client, which is just allows me to connect to my uh, MySQL DB without having to worry about all the li licensing fun. Then we're going to do dependency, and we're going to say Spring Boot Starter JDBC. And now I've just added my ability to connect to a database and record the fact that my app started and stopped. Okay, but I need to do one little thing before I do then, and what's that? Set up my configuration so I can actually what connect to the database. Oops, that was cool. And the way we're going to do that is Glenn once again will cheat. There we go. And this is just you know uh, hooking into my local instance of MySQL. And I'm going to first off clear out MySQL. And I know this will be very hard to see. I'll try to do my best there. Okay. So we will now go back to here, and we will paste our environment variables, which are what? Just my, my data source URL, my root for my password, or sorry, root for username, password, oh my gosh, for password, and then the database. So now what will be a little different is when I run it. It's going to be a little bit hard to see, and I apologize for this. If I go to here where you see the uh, task execution, I'm going to scroll over just a little bit, and I run it, you'll see, and it's very hard to see, but you can see that the app ran. It had an execution ID of 1, start time, end time. It recorded the exit code, and the last time it was updated. Now, let's say we want to be evil, and it doesn't end properly, right? That never happens to your code, does it? Okay, people are still alive. Good. In this case, we're going to do this. Throw new illegal state exception, and we'll say, no task for you. OK. We're going to run it. Okay. And we will see that the exception was thrown. That's OK. What's important, more important about it is something that we see the hello world was printed, but we see the exception. And we also, but see, remember how we had before that after the task ran, we actually had the exit code. And now the exit code is one. I'll, I'll right here, let's see if I can make it up a little bit higher. So we can see where the exception was thrown here, up here, no task for you. But at the end, we still record the fact that it had an exit code of one, right? Now we can go over here, re-execute this, and we see that our second run didn't end so well. It had an X code of 1. Better yet, it told you why. So it recorded it to your log, recorded it to your database, so you now know you can take action on it. So the other thing that we're going to show briefly, and we'll just shrink that down, is this. So mind you, what did I do here? In short, I ran a normal... Spring Boot app, I put enable task on it, that was it. Coding's done. I went, then went and added three dependencies, one for my task, I added a dependency for my database connectivity, which is Spring Boot JDBC, uh, starter JDBC, and what the database driver I would already have, and then configure it. That's it. And you get this feature. This is not necessarily a microservice, what we're looking here. It's just an app that's running, right? These are things that you can take advantage of in your office right now. Okay, so just keep that in mind. And oh, by the way, everything is 1.0 GA as of last week. And except for task is 1.0.1 GA. Okay, it's been out a little while longer. All right, so let's have a little bit more fun here. Um, I promised you a before and after, then I will move on to our next more important topic. And then so we can say before task. And we, I'll tell you what, let me just do the after task. We're running out of time. So after task. And yeah, we want to include you. And then we'll say public void my after task. Now it's going to take what's called a task execution. And we can from here say system.out.println. And we can say my 
task was or ended with, and then we can say plus task execution dot, and we'll just give it a uh, get exit code. There you go. And we fire that guy up one more time. Now, mind you, it will still fail. That's OK. And which it did. But more importantly, what did we get here? Now, mind you, this information down here is just a part of the stack trace. But what's more important is what? We did the cleanup regardless. And the before will always fire, too. So there you go. All right, so we have. Uh, just about finished with tasks, and I promise this will be quick because here's just one more important thing we want to cover, or two. One, a task can be a source. By adding the Spring Cloud stream dependency uh, to a task, it will, at the beginning, emit a, a task begin message and a task end message, so I can actually have a stream that can take this message that the job is kicked off, and we can take action on that task. Now, cases where this would be interesting is it's not when things end normally. What happens when it ends improperly and you want to take action? So you may, instead of having that transform there, what would you have? A filter. And that filter says if the exit code was 0, throw the message away. If it ended with 1, I want you to maybe uh, take some action, automated action that would maybe clean out the database because we know what that error is and restart the job. Because, or and we may not want this, but OK, text somebody, wake somebody up, and have take action. We don't want to do that. That's not the microservice way. We'd rather handle it what? Automated. The other is we can actually have a task as a sync. What does that mean? That means that I can actually have a task launched from a sync. So what's the scenario for that? Maybe we receive a purchase order and from a particular customer, and this customer is a big customer. And their purchase order, we want to handle it immediately, but it spawns up, or maybe it, it needs to spawn up a batch job that goes in, sets up the, uh, the appropriate um, uh, tables so that their purchase order is handled properly, blah, blah, blah. In that case, you can have an like a, a inbound message that filters and say, don't worry about all these other customers, but if we do get this one customer or customers, launch this task. And you can launch tasks based on events that are coming through your stream. So that's another valuable tool. So Spring Cloud Dataflow, third point. My gosh, he's almost there. You'll actually get to see colors here. So in this case, what happens is the Spring Cloud Dataflow is basically we said, OK, that's cool. I can build these services fairly easy. I can build these tasks fairly easy. But what happens if I want to have a stream that I want to dynamically change? change when I need to, or create streams on the fly using components I've already built? What if I want to be able to uh, monitor how my tasks are doing? I should be able to do that. And by the way, I want to do it on Mesos, Cloud Foundry, Kubernetes, or Yarn. Okay, And I don't want to worry about you know, having to write the code to deploy to those platforms. So that's what it basically does. And what you can do is I can create my stream using a simple syntax, and we'll show you that in a second. And I can send that via REST to my Spring Cloud Dataflow server. right? And then what you can do is, oh, by the way, we do have local for development. That's, I highly recommend it. Just You can actually, this, uh, again, we've gone one OGA, so just pull it down and play with it. It'll, by out of the gate, it will use local. But if you're using like Cloud Foundry, you can pull down Spring Cloud Dataflow Cloud Foundry, and it will, instead of deploying to local and creating your streams locally, it'll create them on Cloud Foundry. Um, and Mesos, Yarn, Kubernetes, the ones that don't pay my salary. OK. The other thing you can do is you can use our shell, which is an app that allows you to just create shell scripts to be able to do that. I'll show you that in a second. And then we have a UI, which you can create your streams using a UI, drag and drop. OK. So um, if you are a developer's developer and you like curl, I know that's kind of hard to see, um, I can do a curl post. I can create a stream, name it, my stream. 
and then I can create my stream. In this case, like we've seen how many times? Time, in this case I put filter, and I say uh, for each time stamp that's produced, don't print it unless it has a two in it, and then write that out to a log. And I want it to go, and basically the last part of the curl, I want it to go to my local host 9393 streams, and I want it to be deployed, meaning I can create my definition, but it's not running. But I want this case, I wanted you to create the definition, but I also want it to be deployed to whatever platform I have. Okay? Let's simplify that a little bit. I can use the DSL. I can do what's called just a stream create. Same definition, or same name, name it. Have that definition, HTTP pipe. Again, that pipe acts as our binder. Filter, then expression contains two. Anything that has two, write it out to file. And then a dash dash deploy says deploy it out to the real world. If I don't put the dash dash deploy on there, it just basically says, hey, you know, create the definition, the definition stored. But I can always later on go stream deploy that in the name of the stream and it will make it active and push it out to the real world. Or I can go in and actually just create a stream doing drag and drop. Okay? So, let's go to demo time. So, what we're going to do here is you're going to probably see a very ugly screen. Actually, it's not that bad. Okay. It is ugly. So, stream list. You can tell I was actually using this earlier. All right. Let's do this. Bonk. And I should not have let it go to sleep. Let's see. You didn't see this. Okay. And so we're going to do stream, or sorry, we're going to start up. And again, it's a Java dash jar. And we're going to kick off our Dataflow server local. This means I'm going to be deploying my, uh, my streams locally. And I'm going to kick off my shell so I can interface directly to it. Yahoo. So I'm going to introduce another concept. So what we're going to do is to create a stream. I say stream create foo dash dash definition. And I'm going to call it uh, time pipe. Let's say file. Typing is always good. Directory. Okay, what did I mess up? Let's see. It will tell me in a second. Equals, and we'll say, oh, I know what I did. So with Spring Cloud Dataflow, out the gate, it, if I do this, I can do an app list. Sorry, this is a new feature that we added, which is taking a wave feature. I didn't quite understand that. Is when you deploy in a, into a, a, a stream feature, or sorry, you de deploy using Spring Cloud Dataflow, you saw that list of available apps. Those are the ones we give you by choice, but you may not want all those definitions or all those apps available to you. You may only have one to select. So we offer you the ability to what call register the apps that you want. We have a shortcut that I'm about to show you. It allows you to uh, import all of the um, allows you to import all those uh, apps um, definitions to Spring Cloud Dataflow, and now we can do an app list. And that didn't come out very pretty because there, and now we see that they're there. Okay. And it's just, and this is in the instructions, instructions, but what you'll see is I just basically did an add import and we have a uh, URL that you can pull down the definitions. Okay. In this case, we're going to do this. We're going to say stream create. Again, foo. Pipe. File. And we can have context sensitive help. And I'll say slash temp slash slash a jug fun, and we're going to activate it. Now I can go over here, 
and we can say file sync, and we see once a second it's going to post something out. Okay? It's kind of hard to see, but you can see it's just doing a timestamp. So do you remember all the code I wrote before? Which is okay, it's cool, and how I hand connected it, I showed you how the properties to do that. Um, it's already done. And all I had to do was write one line. Okay? Now, let's have a little bit more fun. And he's like, Glenn, I'm tired of the fun. Stop it. All right, here we go. Now I'm starting to sound like uh, Jim Gaff again. Okay, uh, here we go. So we're going to do a local host, 9393 dashboard. And I can go to my streams. It's kind of hard to see. I apologize. It's a little bit low on the horizon. But you can see that that definition is there. And it's, we can see that it is deployed by going here. And we can see each of the services that comprise my stream that are up and running, food file, food time. If I want to stop it, but not, again, not destroy the definition, I can just click Undeploy. And we can see that it submitted a the request. And we see now it's undeployed. If we go back out to our file, we'll see that it actually stopped. But the stream definition is still there. So we talked a little bit before about using what's called a tap, right? I want to tap off of something. So what if I want to add an exclamation point to my timestamp, but not affect the original timestamp or the original TikTok stream, or what we call our foo stream, right? How would I do that? I'll do a stream create bar. But in this case, I'm going to hook in to the foo stream, right? I want to steal everything that comes off the time source. I want to pop that to a transform. OK, what did I mess up? OK, stream create bar definition. Uh, It will tell me in a second. Uh, transform dash dash expression equals payload dot or payload plus, and then I can say exclamation point pipe file. Oh, I remember. <laughs> Sorry, guys. It's late for me too. Sorry. Okay, here we go. Notice it's a slightly different symbol. Where we had before, we had joined them together using pipes. Now what I'm doing is I'm saying I want to create a copy of that message off of the, from the time once it's sent. Not, I don't want to use the original. I don't, uh, the original, I want it to stay in the stream. But in this case, I want to tap off of it and have a copy of that message sent to me where I can take and transform that message and add an exclamation point to it. And then I will say directory equals and then say slash temp slash a jug fund. Okay, and we'll deploy that. All right, we're not going to see anything yet because why? I haven't deployed the original stream. And it says it's deploying this one, it's deployed, so now if I click deploy on that, I can actually add what they call uh, deployment properties, we don't care. And now it's deploying that stream. Now if we go back to here, the tail, and did I mess something up? I misspelled a directory. Say, ah, a jug you fun. <laughs> that doesn't sound right. Okay, let's do this. We're going to do a destroy that. There is no way to edit a stream. You have to confirm destroy. That is a sad thing. But I will achieve again, and I will go back here. And do that, and a jug fun. Now we go back to here, and we see that it is once again deploying, deploying, deployed. I will now deploy that once again. Again, I could have done this through the command line as well. I'm just trying to show you a little bit of both. And then we go back to tail, and now we get both messages. The key being that I can create as many taps as I want on a stream and take different actions. Going back to remember how we talked about um, having the car. 
We will store everything, write it out to HDFS, we don't care, but I want to be able to tap off and be able to filter and catch those emergencies so I can send notifications to a user saying you need to have your car serviced or whatever. Okay, that's cool. So let's um, go and do this. You should never, by the way, we do have security to prevent you from doing this and restrict what people can do, but I can do out of the box, stream all destroy and destroy all my streams. That's just a quick way of saying, yes, we have security, but I don't have it enabled now. All right, so I am going to show you a little bit, of a, a, a little bit more on the streams. So in this case, I want to do this. I'm going to do a stream create tweets, right? Let's see what's happening on uh, Twitter, right? And so far, uh, somebody did mention this talk. Thank you. Uh, there we go. And we're going to say Twitter stream. Okay. And then we're going to write this out to a log. So it's basically going to cook into the garden hose available from Twitter. But notice I'm not deploying it yet. Okay, that's cool. We're going to take all the garden hose stuff and write it to a log. Who cares? What we do care is what we can do next. And mind you, because of time, I'm going to go ahead and compress this a little bit. I'm going to create a stream, a tap on it, like we saw before. Well, I'm going to tap it, and I just want to grab a field name, entities, hashtag, text. And I'm going to, I want to do counts on just the text that comes across, right, uh, for the hashtags. We can, and we have the ability to have counters so that you can store this information. So that, and we right now use Redis as our data store for counts. And, but also I want to do it for language. Okay. Now, notice that with each of these, I've had the ability to go in and configure, like in this example for the field counter, I can give name, I can do all this configuration, but what about cases where, like my Twitter, when I'm hooking into a Twitter stream, I don't want y'all to see my credentials, right? That would be bad. In this case, we can also have the ability to uh, absorb those through property files. You can also use a config server, if you're familiar with that, um, Spring Cloud uh, config server um, is another valuable tool. But in this case, we are, we're not using it in this demo. But what I did do was say, um, I want you to deploy my tweets, but the properties that I would normally have to have, uh, such as customer uh, my uh, password, my secure password, or was it the, I've got all, there's like four layers of security you have to go through. All that, instead of putting it on the command line, I just took it in from a properties file. And I did it at runtime. So you can actually, when you deploy your streams, you can actually change your configurations. So how can we view that? I can go to analytics. And we can see that right now, for whatever reason, let me shrink that down so it actually fill on the screen. Within just those few lines of code and my access to Twitter, which everybody can have, you just open up a deployment or developer account, you can see a live feed of what's happening as far as hashtags. Okay? The, this is just a, uh, the, they'd put that in for just the sexiness of it, but the overall point is, is that data is being stored to Redis, and we can see what's happening live. What's also is cool is to show that you can actually go to a pie chart Mind you, I didn't, this is just available. So you can take advantage of this and have your own statistics and be able to just view them using just the default what we have. All you have to do is create a field value counter as a sync or a regular counter as a sync and you'll be able to catch that. And we can see right now that the, oh, pie's really bad. Uh, let's choose bubble here. And go back to uh, what's it we want? I think it's counters. Oh no, you want to feel value. I think it's it. Hold on. Let's see. I'm trying to find out what I did with it. I think it's field value counter language. That's what I wanted. So mind you, none of this is this is not pre-existing. This is just creating off the stream and storing it directly into uh, um, Redis. And we now can view the languages as they change. 
of English. You can see there's not much happening here because he's large, but you see some rotation down there. Now, when I told you, like I taught that class a while back on Spring Cloud Dataflow, and that one guy went in, and I won't say the name of the company, but it was at the big department store, and they wanted to see the effectiveness of their campaigns. He did it in like three minutes, said, I can should take this to work tomorrow. So just, I was like, well, can I have your name so I can tell sales about it? And he went, no, oh, that's not right. <laughs> he did, he gave me his name. All right, so um, <coughs> again, we'll do the drastic destroy. Yep, and we will go back to our presentation. There we go. So like we talked about, you can go to uh, Spring Cloud uh, Stream uh, App Starters. I can create my own source processor syncs. I can go to Spring Cloud uh, Starters uh, Task and be able to, uh, or Spring Cloud Task App Starters and create my own tasks using what's there. Or like you saw me did, just do just out of the box using Spring Initializer. It's pretty simple stuff. So I create my own, and you saw where I had that little shortcut where I said app import everything, but let's say I create my own, right? And I do, I create my own, uh, in this case, sync, and I do a Maven install. So it puts it in my local repo. I can then in turn say I want to do an app register. In this case, I created just an R log, right? I'm going to tell it what type, sync, processor, um, uh, source, or task. And then I give it the Maven coordinates. So now what that does, that tells Spring Cloud Dataflow, when he's ready to deploy a stream that has this contained, I can pull this down from a repo, whether it's you know, local, corporate, or you know, you're in the, the cherished zone of putting out to Maven Central, I can pull that down and actually use it directly. The key is, is that Spring Cloud Dataflow does not store that jar. It just stores the location of it and at deployment time, that's when it pulls it and pushes it to the right location, okay? Now, the other thing is, is that we don't like Maven. You can put file. It can be a file to a location to your jar. You don't like that, okay. HTTP, you can do that too. All right, you don't like that. We have S3 available, I think, in the, either the .1 or the .02 release. So you can actually pull resources from S3. So the goal is, is that I can create my jars, I can put them in Maven, on a file system, HTTP, wherever. I can register them, but I haven't done anything other than register the app definition. I create my stream definition using these apps. The stream has now become, what, a application or a microservice application comprised of these small services that I can bind together. And when I deploy it, it pulls down the necessary components or app or jars that I need, deploys them to your local, to your Cloud Foundry, Mesos, Kubernetes, or Yarn. And lastly, um, how do we launch a task? You can, this is just really simple, we'll just do it real quick. And that is, if we do, again, if we do an app list, and we scroll up, we see we have the Spark client cluster, Spark yarn timestamp. Let's just use timestamp, which just logs a timestamp. And I can do a task create. Notice before it was stream, now it's task. And we'll call it uh, my task. Same syntax dash definition. And I'll say timestamp. A little different now. I can do a task launch. Now, as before, it's deploy, meaning deploy these things out there, set them up, let them run. They're forever running until somebody tells them to stop. In this case, oh, yeah, I need to name it, task launch. I just kicked off a task. Okay? Again, 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 again. What does that mean? Those apps, I can start up as many as I need. They start up, they terminate, they're done. They're not persistent, they're ephemeral, they start, they stop, they come to an end. Now how do we know that they actually worked? I can go to my dashboard, go to tasks, go to executions, and you can see that that's where they're at. They ran, 
the app registry that we showed you before, app be able to, to register your, your, uh, your uh, stream or your uh, services or your apps for your uh, streams. Same thing with tasks. Okay. And there we go. And you saw me just do that. And questions? about remote something uh, saying that yes what 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 are you what are you using for a platform? Are you just you're using your own server system right now? Are you on Cloud Foundry, Mesos? Pivotal, okay. In that case, as of 173, they'll be offering tasks. And uh, we are right now, literally, it's not available in the 101 release of task or the 10, well, so just tasks I have to worry about. 10 uh, Spring Cloud Data Flow is ready. Um, they will be offering tasks, which is not available in the 172 version or before for Cloud Foundry. They'll be offering that in the 173. And what you can do is create a partition job like you normally would. But um, go out to the Spring Cloud Task um, website, which is uh, io or spring.io slash cloud slash task, and, or Spring Cloud Task. And there's a section on how to create your own uh, batch job using partitioning, using tasks, and that is available. Or that, well, you can do it locally now, but Cloud Foundry will be 173, which is, um, if, unless they slip it, should be like mid-August, if I've got it right. Okay, but yes, the answer is yes, soon. Soon, good question. Uh, yeah? Uh-huh. Uh, for you can do that. What we have is called deployment properties. So you notice when, back when I showed you the streams before, I was always putting in dash dash, like directory, whatever. Those are what we call environment properties. Those are the things that you're communicating directly to your app with. But you can do what's called, uh, when you deploy, you do a dash dash properties, and you put your deployment properties there. And that says how many you want, how much memory do you need, um, you know, cores and all that stuff. And then also at the same time, you can also specify the other environment variables that you want that, at deployment time. It's a good question. Um, yes, sir. So on the tasks, mm -hmm. is there a configuration team say only run X number concurrently and store them up? Or um, just submit them and execute? They, they submit and execute. Um, we have actually got a, we actually have a issue where somebody has asked that very same question, meaning, I only want of this particular type of task, I only want you know, five running simultaneously. There is one and it is on the backlog, but um, I'm not, don't think it's scheduled for the one one, but um, let me get your information and I'll talk to uh, Michael and Sabby and see where, we, where that is and when it's gonna come in. That's a good question. That is, actually that's the second time I've heard it. Would ever do such a thing? <laughs> it's like security. All right. Uh, other questions? What kind of volume is going through that Twitter? Uh, um, it's just with garden hose, so it's not a lot. Yeah, you know, they have what's called garden hose and fire hose, and fire hose is like everything. Um, and you can. I'm trying to remember if you can do that with this one, um, but it's not heavy duty. It's more of a summary. Right, right. What you could do is actually, um, in that case, um, you could write your own module that could capture that, or I say module, old term. You can write your own app to be able to do that and add it. And um, then from that point, you could do that. We've talked about having that because um, that was one of the questions we did get. It's like, what's the volume through it? Um, that leads me to one aside, and then I'll start answering questions again. One of the common questions is, what's your throughput? How fast, how many messages a second can you go? And my answer is always, 
read my XD article, and that is because it depends. We, we tested like Kafka. Um, we haven't done it on this release, um, but we've done it before under, under the XD auspices, auspices, which is very similar. We were able to get like multi, you know, very similar metrics to what um, Kafka or, uh, gosh, what's his name? You can tell it's, it's late. Um, uh, the guy's article on how fast Kafka is. Uh, but we were able to get, and I actually have statistics on that. My point being is that one of the things that you will that you saw when I have like the uh, message generator and the throughput, um, you also see there's a bridge for process. And what I encourage everybody to do is when they're going live and they have very tight, um, heavy duty load, use these and the generator will create, it's called load generator, will create the load, send that through and you can have, simulate the number of hops you have by using the bridge and then finally having the throughput to do the count. The point is, is that for each hop, you're going to have a, a penalty, a price penalty. And you want to know how fast your infrastructure is. So that's the reason why I say, they say how fast? Well, we've proved it. We can get close on XD. We haven't done the same time trials for Spring Cloud Dataflow, but um, there's a little bit more involved with it because um, now we're talking that it depends on how Mesos behaves and where you deploy it on Mesos, Kubernetes, Cloud Foundry, whatnot. And we want to be able to set up those cases properly so that we can properly enumerate that. But that's a good question. Um, sir. Um, I was wondering how uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow compares to uh, Google Cloud Dataflow. Are you familiar with that? Or that you mean? Uh, like like NIFI like like kind, kind of thing? Or? Or? I'm not familiar what? Like, NIFI? Is that what you're saying? What you're saying? No. Um, um, as, as far as, as performance or differences, differences, you mean? Like, just is like from a product. Same thing, like, uh, I mean, I know, like, with Google Cloud Data Flow, you can create a, a graph and, right, right. you know, follow how the, the data flows through. Does this have any little visuals? No, that was one of the issues that they have. Uh, I saw, I, I did a quick read through because the only two that I've actively studied on the data flow side is, in, is uh, NIFI, or I'm trying to remember, NIFI or NIFI. Uh, from Apache, and then there's another one that uh, was on there from, uh, oh crap, <laughs> uh, you can tell it's late. And I did a, a comparison on those two, but I haven't done one on those yet, no. But we don't have a feature, but that is on the backlog because that has been mentioned. Yeah, for the volume, it's like, where is my data coming from? And that's something that's on the backlog. Mentioned like a drag and drop. You yeah, yeah. You can, <coughs> Go ahead. sir, sir. 10, minutes. 10 minutes. Okay, guys, I, I, let me show this and then I'll uh, start parking lot questions if they're not, you know, if we can't get quick. So in that case, I can go to streams, okay, and I can go to create stream, and I can do, and Vincent knows I will talk all night. <laughs> do log. Attach them together, create stream, TikTok, create. I should have put the deploy at the same time. Uh, sorry, go to streams. We see that it's there. Deploy it. Deploy. Deploying. Da, 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 da. De and. <laughs> deploy. There you go. And you can attach those together and string them together. And then you can also add in properties as you need, you see fit. Okay, yes sir. No. Are these um, access streams meant to be run within containers or can you run them within Spring Foundry without like Docker or anything like that? Well, they, they don't have to be Dockerized. So if it's like Cloud Foundry, they don't have to be Dockerized. But if uh, we have, also you, we have Docker instances for the Spring Cloud stream task starters. So you can, if you're doing Kubernetes or whatever, or Mesos, they're Dockerized for you. So you can take advantage of that. That's available to you through the Spring Cloud Stream starters. Um, and, but if you're doing like a Cloud Foundry local or Yarn, they don't really know Docker. They, they might, they, I just don't know. And uh, you don't have to. Cloud Foundry does Docker if you want to, but most people say, no, I just want to give you a jar and go do your stuff. That's a good question though. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Concerning uh, the taps on the streams, mm -hmm. um, when someone adds a tap, 
can you get notified of it? And can you prevent somebody from? Security, yes. Security will prevent it. Notification, uh, no, I don't know if there's a notification if somebody taps on you, uh, but the creation of a tap can be secured. Okay, uh, I saw another question. Yeah. Oh, um, that is a question that I cannot answer. Um, okay, um, easier to use. <laughs> uh, or the easier to set up is, is, is they're both about the same. Um, with Rabbit, you've got to pearl down Erlang, got to build it, and then it's ready. And then you can add in a plugin to be able to visualize what you saw here. It's, they've got instructions on how to do that. Kafka, you uh, can set up a demo fairly quickly. You just have to do a little bit of configuration on, it may not require that anymore on uh, Zookeeper, because you have to have a Zookeeper instance up and the um, uh, uh, Kafka up. But I think they give you like a sen single server instance to bring up and just play with. Um, I think it's both about the same for complexity. The only thing I'm going to warn you about with Kafka is, and I found out this the hard way. Remember how I told you I did that performance tuning and I ran Kafka locally? And Chris, if you laugh, you know what, know what I'm talking about. I decided to stress test it on my local machine and I didn't set up any cleanup policy on my Kafka. <laughs> and somebody else got it too. Yeah, my machine went to a screeching halt. <laughs> so um, just to keep in mind that it does persist data to the disk, and if you're just doing playing or putzing, it's okay. Just make, just make sure, you know, with Rabbit, you can just say in memory and it just play with it and have fun. But if it's uh, disk-based, just make sure you're not doing stress testing on your machine because you'll find out like I did and go, <sighs> you know, my wife's like, why are you hitting your head for the third time today? So, all right. I'm going to go ahead and say if you have other questions, come up and see me. But uh, guys, y'all have been awesome. And thank you. Appreciate it.